Good evening. Uh, this is your secretary, Dr. Paul, speaking to you. And uh, this is, uh, and welcome to the uh, 15th uh, PG update of uh, the, this year. And uh, you all know that this is uh, happening uh, bi weekly. And uh, we have the web coordinators, Dr. Venkatagiri, our national president, uh, Dr. Rajesh MC from Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut. Dr. Vijish Venugobal from KMCTA Mukkam, it's also Calicut, and uh, Dr. Binil Matthew uh, as uh, is a cardiac an uh, anesthesiologist from Jubilee Medical College. So these are the web coordinators we have. And uh, you all know that uh, the, the today's topic, there are two topics and uh, uh, one is on onco anesthesia. And uh, the second part will be always a PG corner that will be done from the Lisi Hospital, the PGs uh, from Lisi Hospital. And we have uh, their head of the department, Dr. Daji with us. And these PGs are Dr. Indu and uh, Dr. Parvati. Uh, uh, they'll be speaking on Parvati, will be speaking on antiplatelets and uh, Indu on uh, bronchial blockers. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you all know the, we are very lucky to have uh, our speaker, Dr. Dagesh Kark. He has so much, uh, so many contribution to anesthesia. And uh, he is presently working in All India Institute of Medical Science uh, in, from Onco Department uh, and Palliative Care. And uh, he has um, almost six, uh, 260 publications. And he has authored uh, 50, almost 50 books also and uh, you all know that he's the one who who prepared the module for uh, CPR and uh, 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 under the Indian Association Council of Federation and also on the research methodology. So we are very lucky to have him here. For the official welcome, uh, I call upon uh, our uh, state president, Dr. Shamsab Begum. Over to you, madam. Okay. Okay, respected our uh, national president, Dr. Megidagiri, our state secretary, Dr. Paul Orafel, our academic coordinators, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh, Vijesh, and uh, Dr. Binil, and uh, all senior uh, uh, ISA faculty members, our uh, uh, ISA uh, senior members, and also my dear PGs. Good evening, all. So, as Paul said, we are today lucky to have Dr. Rajesh Kag for us to four years bringing a special topic on us that is a, a, a special as well as an interesting topic on the uh, onco anesthesia that is the basic concepts. So it is a rare topic, and uh, we are very lucky to have him because uh, he is, uh, as Paul has introduced, he is uh, um, um, so famous uh, speaker. He is both a national as well as an international speaker. And also he has uh, worked, he has the first one who has uh, came uh, to Trishur, uh, that is the, to Kerala, regarding the introduction of the That's IRC I guidelines. So I welcome, uh, he is from, uh, he is the professor of uh, anesthesiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I welcome you, sir, to this today's uh, PG update program. And the uh, next PG session will be uh, by the academic PGs. That is, the, today we have uh, PGs from the Lissing Hospital in Nagulam. And also, it, uh, the topics are antiplatelets as well as the bronchial blockers done by Dr. Pavadi and Dr. Indu. And uh, the chief, our uh, head of the department, Dr. Rajesh, is also there. I welcome you uh, also to this PG academic program. I then um, I invited our national president uh, to speak some words uh, before we start with our program. Dr. Gregory, please. Thank you, President Aksham sir. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody, especially to Rakesh, uh, good friend Rakesh. Uh, he has made time. Unfortunately, he could not come. Uh, to our uh, SAR conference, uh, he did not get leave and all. It was our mistake also not to send a, uh, there was some delay in from our part to send the official, uh, this thing that uh, aims at some rules, uh, he could not come. But uh, today online he is talking on uh, 
Anko Anastasia. There are a lot of things because uh, I was also thinking that what is there in Anko is like only cardiac anesthesia is different. Other things are uh, all same. It is nothing different. But uh, here in the is here and there by Anko Anastasia. There are a lot of things uh, uh, in Anko Anastasia and the recurrence of cancer or other things. Uh, so today we are lucky that uh, he is giving the basic concepts of Anko Anastasia. Uh, it will be eye-opener for many practicing, especially practice, because your PGs may be known a new thing, but the people who learned 30 years back uh, uh, not know much about Anko Anastasia. Though we, in between do one or two in our then practice Anastasia for Anko Kesu. No, and this will be really good that uh, is a good topic that uh, we will be able to update our knowledge. So thank you, Rakesh, for agreeing. He, he is uh, Rakesh. He uh, does not require Rakesh get any introduction. Everyone knows him. Maybe we may see him as the editor soon uh, um, in the coming year. That was, I do not know that. And uh, OK, uh, thank you, everybody. And I'm happy to be in this uh, uh, meeting to hear uh, Rakesh. And uh, uh, good that uh, we have all uh, seniors, uh, uh, coordinators, uh, our Vijish, Rajesh, uh, and everyone are there, and uh, many faculties. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the kind words. Uh, respected sir, Dr. Venkat Giri, President ISA National, uh, Madam Dr. Shamshed Begum, uh, President Dr. Paula Rafael, uh, Dr. Benil, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Vijish, and all the senior respected uh, ISA members. I think uh, it was uh, unfortunate me to miss the important SARP conference uh, held by you. So I really missed the all the academics and hospitality. But yes, soon I will be coming for some other uh, uh, meetings uh, in some other way to you uh, uh, in the coming times. And thank you so much for today invite. Uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Vankit Giri was mentioning that uh, uh, the onco anesthesia is itself now a speciality because now we have the DM onco anesthesia because there are so much to uh, do differently in these patients. And I'll take you through uh, some of the aspects uh, that is important uh, from the onco anesthesia point of view. So. Uh, I bring greetings from my Olin Institute of Medical Sciences. We have uh, in Ames, we have two onco centers, uh, which is one 25 bedded uh, onco center at Ames main campus. And we have a 720 bedded, if you can see here, the first and second figure. This is the uh, 720 uh, dedicated onco center, which will have almost 24 operation theaters and 15 bedded ICU, which is upcoming. The first phase is over, 250 beds are open, 25 bed ICUs are working, eight theaters are working round the clock uh, for various oncosurgical procedures. So this means there is an increased amount of work that needs to be done differently for oncosurgeries. And probably that's the reason that we need to have some understanding that why perioperative management of oncosurgeries are different. Are they really different? Or it will be the same analgesia, same anesthesia, same postoperative care, same monitoring? That needs to be, I think, I'll take you through in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So when we say about cancer, it's like uh, if you see the cancer, actually this is a picture of cancer. It has multiple uh, uh, legs and wings. Uh, so it is like a serpent which has many aspects, chemotherapy side effect, radiotherapy side effect, they are immunocompromised. There is a risk of uh, uh, recurrence, metastasis. And the most important uh, aspect which is emerging nowadays is the psychosocial financial toxicity that is seen in these patients and that would affect the outcome. And more interestingly, the paraneoplastic syndromes that are seen in some of the patients. And this will make the uh, perioperative period a little different from the routine surgical procedures. That's why probably we need a different approach. We need a different technique so that the perioperative outcome of these patients becomes better. And in a nutshell, if you ask me that what are the differences, probably I will just try to you know, fix up in this slide that the various concerns and challenges will be the impact of cancer per se. It has been seen that the presence of cancer itself affects the physiology of the patient and there will be a systemic and local effect of cancer on various physiologies and obviously the anatomy as well. There would be the impact of treatment these patients would have received like maybe a prior surgical procedure, the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy and in fact the patients almost one third of these patients will be on analgesics also because of the cancer itself. These patients would have uh, other associated comorbidities, like for example, the CA lung, the associated uh, comorbidity will be related to smoking, the liver cancers may be related to the alcoholism. So they will have other associated comorbidities. The psychological impact, most of the time uh, in the perioperative management, we don't talk about the psychological impact, 
But if you see the outcome in a patient who is psychologically depressed, who has uh, may have associated symptoms of delirium, the post-operative cognitive impairment, and hence it becomes very, very important to understand these aspects also. Oncosurgeries are a little different because <clears throat> they can be a little extensive. And the, one of the interesting phenomena that is emerging that whether the anesthetic management itself leads to cancer recurrence, whether the management leads to increased amount of cancer metastasis, and that's an interesting phenomena, and that's why we need to have a little difference in the management of these patients. We need to have a planned anesthetic management, probably a planned perioperative management in these patients so that we can have a good outcome. So what we need is we need to provide, uh, there's nothing called a standard SOP for management of cancer patients. We have to have patient-centered care for these patients because each patient is different. That's why individual assessment and patient-centered goals of care needs to be made for the patient at the first time when they present into the OPD for diagnosis of cancer. So probably it's more of a teamwork. I'll be coming to this point a little later. And that is most important that we need to have preoperative optimization, not only for comorbidities, but also for behavioral, physiologic, hematologic, and nutrition. And this is what is different from the other uh, surgical procedures because they are not usually required for other benign surgical procedures. We need to have a perioperative care, which is goal directed. We need to provide good amount of analgesia to these patients because they are in pain for long procedures. We need to have individualized perioperative care and we will come to it a little later, something called a prehabilitation and then subsequently rehabilitation for these patients. We need to have VT prophylaxis because these patients are more prone for DVT and pulmonary embolism. And this all will lead to something called improved oncology outcomes. So when we manage these patients, it's not just the cancer surgery, we have to provide a perioperative care that improves the oncologic outcome, that these patients do not have increased chances of cancer recurrence. They go back and receive the intended oncology therapy. Like for example, these patients may require post-operative chemoradiotherapy on time. So within four weeks, uh, when these uh, are being started, the patient should be in an optimal condition so that they tolerate and uh, uh, they, they accept the, the chemotherapeutic regimes and the radiotherapy because they do have side effects. So patient has to be well prepared to start on these drugs. And this is the goal of our perioperative care that we make them fit, not only for surgical procedures, but we also make them fit after the surgery procedure for the next cancer treatment. And that's why they are a little different. Now it's a team approach. And that's why, because we are doing so many things in the preoperative periods, intraoperative period and postoperative period. So we need to have a good understanding between our oncosurgeon, the anesthesiologist, the operating staff, the oncologist, including medical and radiation oncology, so that we can make a goals of care from this point from the day one, when these patients are registered in the cancer center, so that they are receiving everything on time at appropriate doses. And this is what we require. We need to optimize the medical conditions which these patients may have. We need to prevent DVT and jaundice. And obviously they may have lifestyle related changes, which again is a predictor of cancer in these patients, smoking, physical activity, like obesity, alcohol use, nutrition, which increase the chances of uh, cancer or cancer recurrence or intolerance to the treatment. And we need to treat them, try to optimize them preoperatively. And this is a very complex thing. So, so uh, we cannot say that only one thing is a predictor. There's so many things, the patient factors, the functional status, the comorbidities, the frailty, all those will affect the cancer outcomes and hence a little bit becomes more complex and we need to provide a goal of care by having holistic assessment of these patients so that we can manage them properly. What investigations are required for these patients? There is nothing specific that need to be ordered routinely for all patients, but they are as per the patient requirement that is individualized as per the requirement of patients underlying physiology change because of the presence of cancer or the effect of therapy that they have received we, can, we need to give them the required investigations, which can range from a 2D echo to maybe as, uh, as uh, big as uh, CPAT or maybe a, a, a stress echo or something like this, which will be required for these patients. Now, uh, you need to remember that uh, uh, these patients are receiving various therapies in the preoperative period. So that's why the, usually we accept if you have seen the uh, Indian Society of Anesthesiologists guidelines more recently for preoperative investigation. We say that three months is an acceptable period for the testing and need not to be repeated again. But in oncosurgical procedures, if these patients are receiving some chemotherapy or radiotherapy, they may have changes in the say blood levels of uh, 
uh, uh, basic counts, RBC counts. They can have change uh, in these parameters because of the bone marrow suppression. And hence the timing of preoperative testing would depend. Three months are acceptable, but if there is change in the clinical status of the patient, you need to repeat them uh, again to look for the impact of various therapy that these patients are receiving. Now, oncosurgery are put in a separate classification with regards to the timing of surgery or the urgency of surgery. And these are being labeled as time sensitive surgery. Cancer surgeries are not urgent or emergent because they will take some time to assess and evaluate these patients. So we have around four to six weeks for these patients and they are labeled as time sensitive surgeries. And hence you need to uh, look for various optimization uh, procedures because they may have received chemotherapy and radiotherapy which have time dependent but variable impact on various uh, body physiology. So you need to look for these changes and try to optimize them as fast as possible. Coming to the therapies, these patients may receive chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but more recently, apart from various chemotherapeutic agents, there are other agents that are being used for management of cancers. These are labeled as targeted therapies, which are monoclonal antibodies or inhibitors. They are cellular therapies, and they sometimes for the research purpose, even cytokines are being used for various therapies as a cancer. Now, the chemotherapy, they have various toxicity depending upon the type of drug, the dose of drug, the cumulative dose, and the patient's status and its timing because when you give chemotherapy the patient will have physiological derangement and they try to improve that's why the chemotherapy are given in cycles so every four weekly or every two weekly depending upon which drugs are being used so that the patient recovers before the next dose is being given but remember if you see majority of these chemotherapeutic agents will have effect on multi-system and that's why you need to assess these patients from each aspect they can affect any system airway cardiac pulmonary renal neurologic, hepatic, hematologic, bone marrow, gastrointestinal, coagulopathies, immune suppression, IACDH. So these are the concerns that can happen in these patients. They can also have impact because of steroids related to increased blood sugar and they can have other complications like tumor lysis syndrome where tumor cells break up and its breakdown products are released into the body leading to hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia and other metabolic abnormalities. So these all effect needs to be assessed needs to be optimized or in case if they are not optimizable, there are some residual effect of therapy, they will have impact on the perioperative management. If you see these side effects, some of these side effects would be immediate. <clears throat> some of these effects are delayed and sometimes even the chemotherapy can present late effects. So it's not very sure that within four weeks, majority of side effects will be okay, but they can manifest a little later. That's why you should be a little cautious that whatever therapy they have received, they still may have residual impact on various body physiology. If you see the toxicity first week, there will be acute changes like hypersensitivity, nausea, vomiting, mucositis, fatigues. And then there will be in the second week, the infection and bleeding impact on the liver function. And then they gradually uh, start uh, recovering from third week and by fourth week they're recovered. And that's why we give them uh, cycles every three to four weeks as a chemotherapeutic agents. But whatever it is, you need to look for this long-term impact which do not recover. For example, when you see bleomycin, they have interstitial injury leading to fibrosis in the lungs. When you give doxorubicin, they can have cardiomyopathy, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, electrophysiological changes in the heart. If you see anti-metabolized, they can have cirrhotic change in the liver. If you give cisplatin, they can have impact on the kidneys leading to uh, chronic renal uh, impairments. And many of the other drugs will have uh, infertility and sometimes even the chemotherapy can be the reason for second malignancies because they cause immunosuppression, they cause change in the body physiology and that's why these patients can have other tumors also. Tumor lysis syndrome, this is one of the important aspects you need to remember because it causes a lot of metabolic abnormality, hyperuricemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, uremia, acute renal failure. And when this happens, it causes a lot of changes in the hemodynamics, affects the kidney, affects the cardiac system, affects the various metabolic derangements. And that's why this uh, needs to be uh, taken into consideration when you are evaluating patients for the purpose of assessment preoperatively for any surgical procedure. And they can lead to a whole array of uh, uh, physiological changes and hence needs very, very important to look for these parameters on blood assessment and look for whether they are being optimized by your therapy or not. The treatment of this is uh, very routine. You need to have a good amount of hydration and sometimes we give them allopurinol so that the renal toxicity does not happen. We try to 
correct the electrolyte abnormalities and sometimes these patients would require hemodialysis because to remove those uh, uh, um, the toxic products or the lysis products, cellular lysis products of tumor cells into the body, they may require hemodialysis. Uh, these patients could have acute surgical issues like bowel obstruction, bleeding, airway obstruction, and that's why when you are assessing these patients, for example, say CA tongue, CA buccal mucosa, CA larynx, sometimes they can come with strider, and hence you need to have an emergency airway management for these patients. Patients with GI cancers, patients with Whipple's procedures, patients with CA ovary, they can have acute bowel obstruction, and many of the time these patients would come us with subacute intestinal obstruction or complete obstruction, and that's why they may not go for upfront surgical procedure, but they will require some stoma formation so that they can be optimized. Hence, you need to assess these patients very, very uh, holistically so that you can pick up these things. The radiotherapy is one of the cornerstone for majority of these cancers. Usually, the, depending upon the type of cancer, the histopathology, 25 to 80 grays are given into fractionated fractions over four to six periods of time. And these radiations, uh, toxicity would depend upon as for chemotherapy, depends upon site of radiation, the cumulative dose and the timing of radiation and they can affect various body tissues by leading, uh, finally leading to cell death because they can lead to the, uh, uh, free radical formation, DNA damage and leading to cell death. The uh, radiation also damages the healthy area near the treatment area, though we nowadays the radiation is more focused uh, as far as including like brachytherapy where very focused radiation is given to tumor cells, but still some amount of damage can happen to the surrounding normal cells also and hence that will be the reason for toxicity in these patients. The side effect will depend upon the parts of body being treated, the dose of radiotherapy, and the ability of healthy cells to repair damage. For example, say uh, abdominal radiation therapy, that will lead to mucositis, the diarrhea, but these are self-resolving. Uh, within two to four weeks, the mucositis resolves very nicely, but this period of two to four, they can have diarrhea, they can have pain, and hence needs to be management. And this is what is required for, say, oral mucositis or GI mucositis or lower GI mucositis. You need to manage a lot of things in these patients because they can have nutritional issues, they can have physical issues like pain, infection, fatigue, psychological issues, patient may not be able to eat. And that's why you need to manage these patients preoperatively so that you can take care or try to optimize these patients appropriately. The other system that can be affected by chemotherapy and radiation therapy is the genitourinary and renal systems. Depending upon the tumor location, like abdominal malignancies, they can be obstruction. For example, CA ovary, CA cervix, they can be obstruction to the ureters, leading to hydro nephrosis and renal dysfunction may de derange. Chemotherapy can have direct renal toxicity leading to acute renal failure. Tumor lysis syndrome can cause renal insufficiency. And these can be acute, they can resolve, or they can have persistent residual effect. That needs to be assessed, needs to be optimized in these patients. Even the infections can be you know, reactivated when the patient is immunosuppressed by various chemotherapy and radiotherapy. For example, say hepatitis B. Otherwise, the patient body may be able to contain this infection. There could be some amount of uh, uh, residual uh, viral load in the patient. But in the patient case where patient is receiving any therapy which causes immunosuppression, they can lead to reactivation of these uh, hepatitis B leading to hepatic dysfunction. And that will depend upon uh, the patient's physical status. It can also lead to hepatovenoclosive disease. This patient can have uh, no uh, progression of the residual uh, uh, chronic disease that these patients uh, have with the underlying liver dysfunction. The drugs like methotrexate, l asparaginase cytosine, aribonocyte, mercaptopurine, streptojocine, these are the drugs which can affect the liver function. And liver involvement can lead to further coagulopathy, the biliary dysfunction, the nutritional issues, and hence they are very related to each other. So the patient will have multi-system involvements. Many of the chemotherapy regimes include steroids as a part of the chemotherapy. And this chemotherapy, as we know, can cause two things mainly. One is the impairment of glucose, that is this patient will be hyperglycemic. And second, they will be immunosuppressed because they will be uh, suppressing the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis leading to decrease amount of internal secretion of various steroids and hence they may not be able to tolerate the perioperative stress and hence need supplementation of the steroids. These patients can also lead to hypothyroidism if the head and neck area is involved and uh, even the drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors which are commonly used nowadays for major surgical major uh, uh, cancers, serafinib or sunitinib 
they can even cause hypothyroidism they can be asymptomatic but if you assess these patients they may show some symptoms and this will require to be optimized prior to the surgical procedure these patients can also have carcinoid crisis now this is an important phenomena where a lot of physiological changing happens wherein various tumors especially the neuroendocrine tumors like pancreatic tumors release serotonin and they can lead to high urinary levels of 5 hia levels uh, and that's why sometimes these patients will have symptoms like diarrhea tachycardia hypotension bronchospasm and these needs to be optimized by giving drugs like octreotide they can have various paraneoplastic syndromes and these patients will manifest in different ways and we need to assess for sidh cushing syndromes eaton limbert syndrome hypercalcemia of malignancy hyponatremia especially in cancer side lung pancreatic duodenal and hence needs to be assessed when you are looking for these patients now coming to the other aspect the airway management if you see these pictures uh, these patients may have uh, various concerns for the uh, tumors which are sitting on the head and neck area even in the upper thoracic areas leading to various amount of airway difficulties any aspect difficult bag mass difficult laryngoscopy difficult uh, supraglottic airway placement difficult regional airway blocks difficult uh, invasive airway like emergency cricothyroidotomy difficult fiber optic bronchoscopy and hence it requires not only assessment but expertise for looking for this the chemotherapy and radiotherapy in fact causes again more uh, airway compromise like causing mucositis trismus limited mobility and they could have more pain when you touch the head and neck area and hence uh airway management becomes quite challenging in these patients you need to have various plans for this you can follow various algorithms which are provided by different professional body like all india difficult airway association wherein we have provided the step wise approach not only intubation but extubation is also difficult in these patients especially when head and neck area is involved because there will be lot of edema and hence you need to follow again basic guidelines for management of extubation where each patient is assessed and a plan is prepared whether to extubate on table whether to tracheostomize this patient or wait for 24 hours to ma manage these patients now coming on some of the important aspects nutrition is one of the important aspects for which many of these patients may not be suitable for surgical procedure even because we know that when a patient has a cancer it causes lot of metabolic changes it suppress nutrition patient may not be able to take they will be more of a nausea vomiting in these patients there will be side effects of chemotherapy side effects of radiotherapy there will be tumor host competition and these all will lead to cancer cachexia and cancer cachexia is one of the very uh, uh, very uh, causes very turbulent perioperative care because these patients may not be able to tolerate major surgical procedures they may not be able to tolerate even a 500 ml of blood loss their bmi will be less than 20 and this causes a lot of uh, reason to optimize these patients preoperatively so that when these patients are optimized they can have better outcome and it has been found that a low serum albumin levels of less than 3 g per deciliter has been shown to increase the risk of post operative morbidity and mortality also and hence we need to optimize these patients as far as possible the other aspect is the cancer pain majority of time these patients would be in pain pre operatively and you are required to not only do a psc for these patients but provide pain relief for these patients and uh, when the pain is present they can cause variable issues the cardiac issues the hypercoagulability the catabolic state and hence it is very very essential that we need to treat these patients so that the various complication associated with pain is taken care of and hence you need to manage this pain not only intra op post op but pre operatively because if the tumors are present remember whatever the patient is receiving in the pre operative period they may be receiving various opiates and adjuvants if you stop it for the intraoperative period or preoperative period as a part of npo they can have withdrawal syndrome and it is very very essential to continue the basal dose of steroids with these patients are receiving and then add on over to it for the surgical insert so that you are taking care of these patients you can follow the who step ladder pattern which is one of the acceptable modality for cancer pain management depending upon the numerical rating scale or the pain severity multimodal approach remains the important aspect in the perioperative surgical procedure we usually use uh, regional blocks along with iv analgesics for these patients maybe a combination of csea epidural lumbar thoracic region intrathecal opiates but try to you know curtail the nsaids because they may have underlying cardiac disease they may have underlying renal disease they may have coagulopathy supplanted dysfunction by nsaids may be avoided but we do give a lot of uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen in these patients 
immunosuppression. This is an interesting phenomena we need to remember because uh, these patients are immunocompromised because of cancer per se or because of the therapy like chemo radiation, they suppress the immune system of the body. The adrenosuppression happens because of the drugs like steroids and hence it becomes very, very essential to follow very strict uh, uh, aseptic precautions during IV cannulation, during regional blocks, during CVP line insertion and even during the airway management so that the lung infections are not increased and that's why you should be very cautious to follow all the aseptic precautions when these patients are being managed. Now, having said that, there is a lot of issues which I have uh, mentioned. Can we correct them? Can we optimize them? Yes, we can. And this is how called as prehabilitation, which is basically the optimization of these patients preoperatively so that we can improve the outcome of these patients. And what we need to do is we need to optimize various aspects like medical optimization, the physical activity, the glycemic control, the nutrition, the pain, the relaxation strategies. They can have psychological issues, the occupational care, lifestyle modification like alcohol or smoking suggestion. And if you see this chart, basically, I think this is an important chart here. Uh, this is something like uh, when you want to go for a marathon, you cannot go on a one fine day and try to go for marathon because you will not be able to finish it. You need to prepare yourself. You need to uh, practice yourself. You need to optimize yourself. And then you go ahead and take care so that you can run the marathon successfully. And this is something similar in the cancer care. So what we term is as prehabilitation as preoperative phase, enhanced recovery program as perioperative phase and rehabilitation in the postoperative phase. So this needs to be done for your patient so that patient has successful improved perioperative outcome or sometimes we label as return to the oncology treatment which these patients are supposed to listen. So what are these? We need to have prehabilitated these patients and these are four main aspects that needs to be prehabilitated for all your patients. Medical optimization, no confusion. These patients are having a lifestyle modifications. They, they, they may be smoker, they may be alcoholic. You need to stop them. But when they are stopped, they can have withdrawal syndrome. <clears throat> so you need to not identify them and try to optimize them. The preoperative exercise program. This is very, very important to enhance the patient's uh, uh, no, uh, endurance for the major perioperative surgical procedures. And now we have identified that these patients, when they are uh, undergoing, uh, um, uh, have, um, uh, have under uh, um, uh, impaired functional capacity, these patients are malnourished, they have anxiety, they have anemia, they have sarcopenia, decreased muscle mass and frailty. And that's why these patients need to have improved in these functions by structured preoperative exercise program. As per the patient capacity, they can do increased amount of uh, various exercises as these patients are suitable for. And the functional capacity is commonly assessed by simple, as simple as six minute walk test, or we can have uh, advanced machines like cardiopulmonary exercise test. How much, how much duration these patients should undergo? I said these are time sensitive surgeries. We have four to six weeks while these patients are being assessed. Sometimes they have received chemotherapy, so we have four weeks, uh, four to six weeks for the optimization of the impact of chemotherapy before they are posted for surgical procedure. So this is the time where we can take advantage of uh, optimizing these patients so that their uh, functional capacity becomes much better. Nutritional optimization. These patients are uh, almost, if you can see, more than 50% of our patients in India are malnourished. And if you see patients like CA ovary, CA stomach, more than 75 to 80% of patients are malnourished. And we know that any albumin less than three grams has increased amount of uh, morbidity and mortality in the perioperative period. The malnutrition can be because of various reasons, tumor induced metabolic abnormalities, inadequate intake, catabolic phase, GI abnormalities, obstruction, impact of GI therapies like radiation and chemotherapy causing mucositis and pain. And this is what uh, leads to various impact like increased risk of complications, poor wind healing, prolonged length of hospital stay, prolonged length of ICU stay, delayed recovery, higher rates of readmission, increased incidence of postoperative death. Hence, we need to have a goal of care for these patients and gradually we need to have a good dietitian op opinion for these patients and do have enteral nutrition for these patients with uh, specific uh, um, no, uh, focus on various uh, protein supplements, home care based supplements so that they are better based. And we can use various clinical markers of increased nutritional risk for these patients. We usually look for albumin levels, but yes, sometimes these patients have <clears throat> decreased amount of uh, muscle mass that becomes an important issue.
So think of the nutrition in these patients. Antral is always possible, is always preferred, but sometimes in some patients, if not possible, you can think of parental nutrition, preferably peripheral, but sometimes total parental nutrition may also be considered in these patients to improve the nutritional uh, efficacy for these patients. Immunonutrition, they have always remains into controversial, but yes, uh, they have been found as a routine supplement and they can be given. We do not know the exact dose of duration, but they have some impact. The drugs like glutamine, arginine, omega-3 fatty acids, these are the immunonutrition that can be administered to these patients preoperatively with some possible fair effect on these patients. Anxiety. Many of the times we are not much concerned about this anxiety, but in cancer patients, this is important because the psychological distress, anxiety in these patients can lead to immune dysregulation, impaired wound healing, greater post-operative pain, prolonged functional recovery, poor quality of life. And this is what we are looking for, the post-operative uh, rehabilitation of these patients. And hence, we need to take all steps to allay anxiety, which could be counseling in these patients, making them understand the procedure, giving them good pain relief, not only uh, perioperatively, but preoperatively also. We can advise them deep breathing, relaxation training, yoga, music therapy, and these are helpful for these patients to allay anxiety. When to start prehabilitation? I said it's a, it's a time sensitive surgery. So whatever time you have, whatever uh, four weeks to six weeks you have, you should start doing prehabilitation to these patients using a multimodal approach. At our center, whether we are anesthesiologists, whether surgeon, whether geriatrician, whether physiotherapists, all will concern, will take their step Wherever they go, they will take care of. For example, physiotherapists will exempt them exercises, incentive spirometry, deep breathing exercises. Dietitian will take care of their high protein diets. They will take care of proper nutrition. Uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists will take care of other aspects of prehabilitation, including counseling. And that's why multimodal approach is preferred for these patients. Rehabilitation, this is again an important aspect uh, for our patients because these patients will have a lot of residual effect of the surgical procedures. And there are studies now that those patients who receive prehab, they have a better outcome. Those patients who do not receive prehab, they have poorer outcome, poor quality of life. But those who received both prehab and rehab, you can see this chart, prehab improves the function of life preoperatively. And when you add rehab, they also have improved outcome in the post-operative period. And that becomes very essential because these patients are supposed to receive various therapies even after surgery. And hence, you patients should receive a combination of prehabilitation and rehabilitation by anesthesiologist so that these patients have improved outcome of cancer and quality of life. Now, coming to the other important aspect in oncosurgery, now we are looking for the RAS protocols because uh, various cancer surgical procedures, they follow various evidence-based perioperative clinical pathway, which is called ERAS, and they have been found to improve the functional recovery of these patients. So these are the basic uh, 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 various steps that needs to be taken. A good analgesia, whole directed fluid therapy, taking care of DVT because cancer is a prothrombotic phase, good counseling, early ambulation, good pain relief will lead to early ambulation and that is virtually desirable in these patients because they decrease DVT, they decrease lung, from, uh, lung issues, the, the patient recovery becomes much better. Nutrition, temperature control, analgesia, Prevention of ileus, we remove the NG tubes as soon as possible in the RAS protocol so that the bowel activities are much better. Remove NG tubes, remove catheters, drains at the earliest. And then look for uh, fasting in these patients, carbohydrate loading, which is now an important part. And we don't give them benzodiazepines pre-medication for these patients to have more faster recovery. And the benefits are many. Accelerate functional recovery, less than the hospital, more patient satisfaction, Reduce readmission rate, lesser amount of ICU stay, and this is what we look for in these patients. Hence, all patients should receive ERAS protocols. The other important aspect in cancer surgery that these patients are prone for anemia, more amount of perioperative blood loss because cancer surgeries are intensive. They could be coagulopathy. They are having prothrombotic phase, but they can also have bleeding also. And hence, uh, the risk of blood transfusion, which is now I will come in a little later, that what harms cause is there a blood, blood transfusion in cancer patients. Mm -hmm. An embolism can happen and these all can affect the oncology related outcomes. Anemia, common in many patients, nutritional anemia, decrease intake, they can lead to various aspects of deficiency leading to uh, anemia in these patients. But the issue is, do we need to have blood transfusion in these patients? There is uh, various studies where say that if you give them blood transfusion, probably the mortality rate is higher 
in patients who are anemic than those who are not anemic. And when we see the um, blood transfusion practices, we have been found that the perioperative anemia with blood transfusion increases the risk of recurrence and mortality. So I think this is a double-edged sword. We need to treat the anemia, but not with blood transfusion, but with proper nutrition and proper hematemic agents that needs to be given to these patients because the prognosis becomes poorer if you give blood transfusion to these patients. Cancer relapse is much more even in an Indian study that we have been seen and reported from India. So that's why you need to follow this important chart. You can get it easily on the net. What you need to do is you need to assess these patients, look for whether they are having iron deficiency anemia, protein deficiency, try to treat them by supplementation of iron in these patients rather than giving blood transfusion. And that's why we need to look for these three, three pillars. First, optimize hematopoiesis by IV hematonics, minimize the blood loss and bleeding like <clears throat> using a lot of coagulation, a lot of uh, uh, no, cauteries in, in these patients, maybe harmonic scalpels and try to uh, optimize the physiological status by optimizing various optimal conditions. But remember, transfusion is not good. They can lead to increased amount of infection, pulmonary and renal injury, increased amount of stroke, MI, increased length of hospital stay, increased mortality, increased cancer recurrence. And hence, transfusion should be avoided in cancer patients and they should be optimized using other therapies you can use for, like for example, meticulous surgical technique, use of posture, head and vasoconstrictors, tunicates, regional blocks, pharmacological therapies like tranexamic acid, they can be used to manage these patients. On the other aspect, they can have various coagulation issues uh, because of the pathway which is affected by cancer. They can have both increasing and thrombosis no, yeah. because they will have major issues uh, when you're managing these patients. And if you see the hemostasis, they have uh, change in the uh, various functions of platelets. They have endothelial change because of cancer and therapies and coagulation cascade is affected that can lead to various impact. Cancer remains hypercoagulable state and hence increased chances of venous thromboembolism from DVTs in these patients and hence you need to optimize these patients because the virtual trials are fully applicable for cancer patients. They have stasis, they have vessel wall injury, they have hypercoagulability happens in cancer and to prevent thrombosis and the chances of the risk factors, the outcome of venous thrombosis after oncology surgery. If you see the outcomes, you can identify the high risk factors like female gender, older age, the site of tumor, if the patient has received previous surgeries and even you can have some biomarkers like elevated D-dimer. All those risk factors will give an idea that this patient, this specific patient is increased chances of venous thrombolism. Certain cancers like breast, prostate are lowest. Pancreas, brain, ovarian, hematologic stomach, they are very high risk for venous thrombolism and try to follow various modalities to prevent DVT leading to embolism, which can happen in most one third of patients and they can manifest various issues. You can use screening like ultrasound screening. You can start them on anti-thrombotic therapies, uh, which could be pharmacological and non-pharmacological. You can use these type of venous compression devices compression stockings to prevent the chances of DVT and treat them. Nausea vomiting is an important issue because majority of chemotherapeutic agents are amatogenic. And hence you need to give a combination of various therapies uh, to prevent the chances of amesis in these patients. And you can use combinations of drugs like condensate with Nowadays, uh, in certain therapies where a highly amatogenic uh, potential is seen, we can use NK1 receptor antagonist as appropriate also. For anesthesiologists, do we have little concerns about cancer spread? Yes. As anesthesiologists, we may have role in prevention of cancer metastasis. We need to follow anesthesia technique. Anesthesia drugs can cause cancer recurrence. And there are many studies. Opiates, especially morphine, can lead to cancer recurrence. So be careful about these things. The, you, the presence of pain itself, the stress response, the suppression of the immune response, the volatile agents, these okay. all has been found to increase the chances of cancer recurrence. On the other hand, the local anesthetic agents, the anesthetics, the suppression of pain, they have been found to prevent the cancer recurrence. And hence, we need to develop a technique wherein the strategies which have impact on cancer recurrence is taken care of. We can have techniques like regional blocks. We can use techniques like TIVA instead of volatile anesthetics. We can have certain combination of techniques like plus general anesthesia 
so that the dose of volatile agents is decreased and we can use a lot of sativa in these patients so that chances of recurrent LPs and uh, this has already been reported also in literature the reason anesthesia benefits beyond pain it decreases the cancer recurrence and these are the various features that we need to look for surgery itself the hypothermia psychological stress intravenous agents inhalation agents volatile agents the reason anesthesia is preventive. Blood transfusion can increase cancer recurrence. Pain can increase cancer recurrence. Cox inhibitor decrease cancer recurrence. So this means <clears throat> we need to put up a technique which is cancer recurrence protective. And hence, our role in preventing cancer recurrence is equally good. As an anesthesiologist, sometimes we need to prognosticate these patients because sometimes these patients become inoperable. And when these patients are going into post-operative phase, it becomes our duty to prognosticate that these patients may have residual symptoms like pain. They can have obstructions. And hence, as anesthesiologists, we should not only be involved into treatment, diagnosis, or surgical procedure, we should also be very uh, know, through by explaining the prognosis to these patients if they have been found inoperable or the cancer recurrence comes to you for major surgical procedure. We should be prognosticating these patients essentially and providing them good symptom relief. So considering some special aspect like CRS and HIPAC, this is the important uh, procedure which is being done, especially for ovarian cancers and peritoneal malignancies. I may not be going to detail, this itself is a full topic, but here what you do is the patient requires an extensive surgical cyto reduction, followed by what is new here is hyperthermic chemotherapy intra-abdominally. So we have side effects of not only chemotherapy, but hyperthermia, to the tune of 42 degrees Celsius in the abdomen for 60 to 90 minutes causes a lot of physiological changes in the body. Metabolic change, renal change, GI change, hepatic change that happens in these patients. And when we go for these procedures, we have to look for improved outcomes, but simultaneously we have to look for various concerns that can happen through various surgical procedures. So these patients after induction will go cytodeductive surgery with good amount of blood loss, then hyper, hyper, the side effect of chemotherapy and hyperthermia, then the wound reconstruction and post-operative care remains very turbulent. But if we can have a plan of care for these patients, the outcome becomes good. So to summarize for oncosurgical procedures, the cancer and its treatment have significant impact on the patient involving various body systems. These treatments have impact on various manifestations at variable point of time. Some may have recovered, some may have residual effect. So that's why the assessment is very, very important to look for the impact of treatment therapy and try to optimize these patients uh, in the preoperative period by following various prehabilitative techniques and do have a planning of perioperative care for these patients so that these oncosurgical procedures have a good outcome. It's just not the surgical procedure, but what we are, what we are looking for that these patients are stable enough. They can tolerate the postoperative uh, the intended oncology therapy, which may be chemotherapy and radiotherapy in the procedure after, after the surgery. So we have to make them fit within four weeks after the surgery to tolerate these aspects. And this becomes role of anesthesiologist to provide this care also. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm open for further questions. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. It was a fantastic presentation. We had your lecture last year on HIPEC. And uh, before that, uh, uh, you are uh, talk on publication, research publications, and are also. So now the session is open for question and answers. Any comments and questions from the senior faculties as well as from the students? So, uh, Dr. Akesh, so it was a nice uh, lecture, and you have touched upon almost all aspects of uh, onco anesthesia care. And uh, one doubt I have is uh, whether uh, how common is acute tumor lysis syndrome in the perioperative settings? especially intraoperatively, and is there any techniques to prevent the occurrence of uh, tumor lysis syndrome? And, uh, third, uh, and uh, third thing is that before taking up of the case, is there a possibility to go uh, gauge like uh, this patient is likely to have this problem in the intraoperative period? So tumor lysis syndrome is more common in uh, rapidly proliferating tumors uh, like myelomas and those things, and they are usually manifested once they are receiving chemotherapy because chemotherapy will cause a lot of cellular destructions uh, leading to the cellular products into the into the body system leading to uh, the manifestation that i've already mentioned 
and uh, sometime when these patients are posted for surgical procedure after chemotherapy so during this pro uh, period when they come up for PSE we need to be very cautious if somebody is a little drowsy your patient is having some little ectopics the patient the patient is feeling palpitations then we should be looking for these features uh, these are not very common but these are not uncommon also we we do find them uh, every week there will be one or two patients which will be having tumor lysis syndrome at our center so that's a pretty good number not less uh, in case uh, if they are posted for surgical procedure the morbidity and mortality is very high so that's why we need to identify the metabolic abnormalities and majority of time these mm -hmm. patients respond well to good hydration so that's the key principle that hydration needs to be maintained that's why uh, we allow these patients to uh, have good oral diets and once they manifest any signs of uh, tumor lysis syndrome we try to IV hydrate them and maintain a good urine output of more than 2 to 3 ml per kg per hour in these patients so that renal shutdown is not happening and the electrolyte imbalance is taken care of. Intraoperatively, majority of time, uh, the tumor lysis syndrome is not a big issue because the tumor itself is taken out. So that's why the destruction may not happen. But uh, sometimes because of the uh, increased amount of bleeding and dissection, there could be uh, some amount of hypotension, hypoperfusion in these areas. But that is not a tumor lysis syndrome, that is basically the perfusion deficit that can happen in these patients. So those are being managed and uh, probably for those, the, the lactate levels are important markers to look for perfusion. For TLS preoperatively, post chemotherapy, we do look for hyperuricemia, uh, lactate levels in these patients, the potassium level in these patients, the, uh, the, the calcium level in these patients to look for the abnormalities that these patients have. Is there any specific chemotherapy agent uh, which may precipitate uh, acute tumor lysis syndrome so drugs like like cisplatin and all those agents are anti-metabolites these agents are more prone for the uh, uh, mass destruction of tumor cells so any tumor cells which is rapidly proliferating with these drugs there are more chances of uh, tumor destruction leading to tls okay. thank you uh, any, qu any questions from the audience uh, uh, Rakesh, uh, the prehabilitation that uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh has mentioned. So if you're waiting, because um, what we say is as early as possible, once we have diagnosed the malignancies, we have to do the surgery. Otherwise, uh, the, pe the period by which that we are waiting, the malignancies is getting spreading more. So uh, what is the uh, minimum day, a uh, minimum period for which prehabilitation can be done? So usually when we say when the patient comes for the first time with the uh, presence of some lump or some uh, sign suggestive of cancer, so that's why it's, it's a team approach. So whenever the patient approaches for the first time for getting registration for in the cancer registry, so that's the time prehabilitation starts. So we should not be losing any time. So if a patient comes and there's a lump, is suggestive of uh, cancer, uh, patient will undergo a biopsy, patient will undergo review, patient will undergo uh, various testing. So usually it takes around two to three weeks for the patient to be uh, no, uh, undergoing those investigations. And cancer surgeries, uh, if you see, uh, depending upon the type of cancer, for example, say, if you see the lung cancers, the buccal mucosa, they are not so fast growing. But if you see cancer like uh, cancer uh, gallbladder, cancer pancreas, they are a little fast growing. So depending upon the cancers that they have, you can have a period of two to three weeks. So that two to three weeks definitely should be considered for optimizing these patients. Majority of time, if you see the surgical setting, the patient is sent to the anesthesiologist once they have assessed everything and they have planned that this patient is posted for lab cholecystectomy or lab hysterectomy and then they send for PSE. So in onco setup, uh, these patients, whenever they come for the first time, the onco surgeon, the onco anesthesiologist becomes a team approach. So we have something called tumor board. So at that point of itself, if patient is a BMI of less than 20, albumin of less than 3.5, they are referred to that dietitian on the day one while they be, are being assessed for uh, various uh, surgical planning. So this means we have to take advantage of this lean period or window period while these patients are being, uh, no, uh, being assessed to prehabilitate these patients, whether we talk of nutrition, whether we talk of uh, deep breathing exercises, incentive spirometry, uh, uh, the, uh, the exercise programs, anything. We need to use, utilize this uh, period, window period for prehabilitation and majority of patients we have two to four weeks available with us and we are able to uh, at least have an improving trend of various uh, uh, pre uh, prehabilitative markers in these patients uh, so that they can be optimized to a large extent. Especially for CA breast and on, 
we have to do as early as possible like that that we are doing the breast usually the the, uh, the peripheral surgeries uh, the lumps and the uh, tumors which are on the surface of the body they usually do not have much issues with the nutrition and other aspects yeah so okay. that's why they they may not be requiring a lot of amount of prehabilitation as such the nutrition is okay in ca breast surgery so they can be taken as early as possible but if we say talk about ca esophagus ca stomach ca bre uh, ca uh, gallbladder ca pancreas uh, colon uh, lungs now the uh, ca ovary ca endometrium these are the tumors where they will uh, they will have chances of uh, decrease intake increased loss like ca ovary a lot of ascites will happen in these patients so they are losing a lot of proteins from the ascites so ca stomach they will not be able to take inside ca colon they will be bleeding a lot and they will be losing proteins and blood from the uh, bleeding aspect so these are the patients which require prehabilitation the surface lumps the breast these uh, <clears throat> these patients usually does not have major physiological change and that's why they may not be uh, requiring a uh, large they, they may not be having impaired aspect but some of the ca breast uh, patients may have received chemotherapy and radiotherapy uh, pro probably the chemotherapy not the radiotherapy so they may have chemotherapy induced changes so the last cycle of chemotherapy usually these patients are posted for surgical procedure at 4 to 6 weeks of the last chemotherapeutic cycles so that 4 to 6 weeks should be taken as a window period for optimizing the side effects of chemotherapy in these patients thank you what about uh, hyper surgeries uh, are they uh, been done uh, like earlier yeah hyper surgeries are very we are doing almost uh, two to three hyper surgeries in our center and these hyper surgeries uh, require a lot of issues one i say cyto reduction so they have extensive removal of the abdominal organs because wherever the tumor is they want to the peritoneum omentum ovary and nixal tissues so uh, even the, sometimes the liver hepatectomy is so a lot of tissues are removed so they can have lot of uh, blood loss lot of physiological changes this is one aspect and that's why these patients needs to be optimized uh, like ca ovary peritoneal malignancy there will lot of ascites and protein loss so that's why we start them on a uh, high protein diet in the pre operative period while they are being worked up for various cancers and markers uh, they they are started on a uh, high protein diet they are started on uh, graduated exercises we ask them to at least walk with increasing pace for whatever time they have and then we can start them on uh, taking care counseling sessions so that they are not anxious they are they are uh, doing various uh, physical activities uh, accordingly we start them on incentive spirometry and deep breathing exercise because they have a lot of diaphragmatic splinting because of the uh, uh, ascites in these patients so these are all started and then they can tolerate the hypex much better though there are a lot of hypex changes that can happen because of chemotherapy and hyperthermia intraoperatively but if they are optimized pre operatively majority of time we are able to uh, uh, no take a good outcome from these patients versus those patients who does not have uh, prehabilitation or optimization prior to the surgical procedure what about the acidosis immediate acidosis which can happen uh, uh, after the hypex uh, majority of post operative majority of these patients because of extensive surgery and because of the hypex majority of time these patients will have uh, acidosis and they will have gradually increases increased amount of lactate levels because uh, the perfusion will decrease because of the blood loss and these patients will uh, um, gradually if you see even after the post operative period for next 4 to 6 hours there will be increasing trend of increased lactate levels majority of time these patients are well managed by giving them good hydration with good urine output so we give them a goal directed fluid therapy for these patients at least for the first 12 to 24 hours and sometimes even blood transfusion is required for these patients and the uh, reemergence of intraoperative albumin is now uh, indicated for selected group of patients especially when the preoperative albumin is less than 3 and they go extensive cyto reduction sometimes we give intraoperatively rather than giving a lot of fluid because a lot of fluid can cause overloading and uh, they can lead to decrease increase amount of uh, bowel edema lung edema Uh, peripheral perfusion is decreased because of edip, this edema that's why we don't give a lot of amount of fluid as a bolus in these patient <clears throat> it sometimes we need to give them albumin and then a goal directed fluid therapy and that is continued at least for 12 hours post operatively and that flushes out uh, the various metabolic products of the hypex insert which is hypex and the kidney once started flushing these products out of it the acidosis improves the lactate starts decreasing if the anotropes are there they starts decreasing and within 12 uh, within 12 hours we are able to extubate these patients by giving this type of therapies with hydration goal directed fluid therapy giving them some albumin 
good analgesia, some amount of ventilatory support for first 12, 12 hours, and they come out nicely. And regarding the, the, duration, of the duration of timing uh, of high pitch, uh, do we really restrict the surgeons uh, uh, the duration of high pitch? Uh, usually, uh, most of uh, most no. of the time, most no. of the time we are able to uh, no allow them to have an high pack of 60 minutes and sometimes even 90 minutes also in majority of patients. Uh, you can say maybe one in 50 patients, uh, we have to stop high pack at say half hour or 45 minutes because they are becoming hemodynamically unstable uh, because high pack will lead to increased mm -hmm. amount of uh, decreased general perfusion or de increased amount of acidosis leading to hemodynamic collapse. So sometimes we have to decrease it. Uh, by duration, but that is not more than one to two percent. Majority of time, we are able to do it. Sometimes, uh, if the intraoperative situ reduction is too turbulent, they have been vascular injuries, good amount of blood loss. In those patients, sometimes we postpone the high pack for next day. So these are called a uh, phased high pack, and there is a new technique which is coming, and we are doing it at our center. It's called APIC. So these patients who are not able to tolerate high pack intraoperatively because of the uh, the increased amount of blood loss or they are hemodynamic unstable. Once they go into two inotropes intraoperatively because of cyto reduction, we don't go for high pack in these patients. And then we go for APIC. So postoperatively, uh, for five to seven days uh, through the catheters, drain catheters, they are giving uh, they are the, the uh, hyperthermic chemotherapy for five to seven days in these patients in the postoperative period. So there's another strategy in the high risk population. But majority of time, uh, uh, almost uh, more than 90% of time, we are able to uh, do the planned surgical procedures along with high patch. Good. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Rakesh, one more question. Then is, uh, is the team is meeting every day before you plan for the surgery? So uh, I, I think uh, there's nothing called very official meeting each other, but each patient, uh, we have collaboration in some way or the other. And majority of these patients uh, come to us, so uh, we have a combined language. Now, uh, when the patient goes to surgeon, he will speak all the four or five things of prehabilitation. Even they have made a stamp now, so they will put the stamp on their uh, OPD card regarding the uh, deep breathing exercise, stimulation, uh, exercises, uh, mobilization, uh, high protein diet, uh, the, the dietitian referral. So every of us is on the same platform. Then. If the patient is sick, we get a referral two to three days prior when these patients are admitted and then we take a combined approach. We discuss all the patients and if once the patient is fit, uh, we uh, again review the patients a day prior and the intraoperative we are combined together and for next two to three days, we are taking a combined rounds along with the surgical oncologist to take the decisions in a combined way. So it's more or less a team approach. Thank you. Rakesh, uh, Dr. Rakesh, uh, is the concept of tumor recurrence still re relevant? Because I have seen some st studies, uh, uh, large population-based studies questioning the concept. And yeah. if at all, it is for the uh, old uh, opioids like morphine. Right. I also think this is question because uh, three to four years back, the hypothesis generated that immune suppression, use of morphine, use of volatile agent will bring about certain changes in the body because when the tumor surgery is being done, there will be some tumor cells which are released into the body. This is very obvious and that's the reason for metastasis. But body physiology will capture those cells and they will try to damage them. So that's the patient's inherent capacity to kill the tumor cells. So the hypothesis was that the, this patient inherent capacity for those tumor cells which are released into the body system during surgical resection, whether they will lead to cancer recurrence or metastasis and whether the anesthetic technique will lead to these amount of uh, uh, insult. So there was some, uh, some hypothesis, there was not robust uh, randomized controlled trial. Uh, there are certain trials which are ongoing, certain things like especially the opiates, uh, they have been found that they have not much role nowadays. The data is upcoming, we are not very sure. But if you see the other point of it, why not to give a good analgesia for these patients? Regional yeah. anesthesia has to be given. So why should we not giving them the drugs which are we know beneficial? Regional anesthesia is a good drug for laparotomy because it decreases the blood loss. It decreases the opiate requirement. So some of the factors which we know is beneficial, why not to use them? TIVA has its in, uh, inherent role. Uh, uh, why should not we use it? Analgesia, pain. Pain itself is a factor that can cause analgesia. Hypothermia. So hypothermia causes increased cancer recurrence. But why we are expecting hypothermia? That's a routine role that patients should be normothermic. 
So this means many of the factors which causes increased amount of cancer recurrence are supposed not to be doing with the patient. So we are supposed to you know, optimize them. No patient should be hypotensive. No patient should be hypothermic. No patient should be in pain. No patient should be on ventilator for long periods. No patient should be on steroids perioperatively for any reason. So I think many of the factors we are automatically taking up, which possibly has some role in the cancer recurrence. We are looking for the data, but uh, not very sure now. Thank you, Rakesh. Any questions? So there is one question in the chat box. No, there is a comment from Dr. Paul. Please post your questions in the queries in the chat box. Okay, any comments or questions from the senior faculties? For students, it's an important topic not often discussed in the CMEs or uh, not seen in the textbooks also. So it's a nice time to clarify your doubts because we have an authority, Professor of Oncoanesthesia from our AIMS. Please make use of this opportunity. So if there are a, no more comments, can we go to the next session? Dr. Vijish. Oh, thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the yeah. kind invite. Okay. I hope uh, the PGs are uh, benefited. That's in why in the introduction, I said it is an interesting as well as the most special topic for today. Thank you, ma'am. In case okay. if somebody has uh, any comments, you can uh, WhatsApp okay, me. Okay, we can directly contact you. Okay, yeah. sir. Thank you, so Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh Garth, for that wonderful uh, uh, exposition on, on coanesthesia. We move on to the PG corner. And this time, the PG corner is from uh, Lissy Hospital. And uh, we have two students, PG students from uh, Lissy Hospital, Indu and Parvati, who will be talking. And to moderate this session, we have Dr. Rajiv with us. Over to Dr. Rajiv. Indu and Parvati, uh, like you can, whoever is starting can uh, uh, share your screen. Yeah, if to check the screen, yeah, we have not done that before the session. Okay, good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Rajiv from Lacey Hospital. It is indeed a privilege to entire Lacey Hospital Anesthesia Department that we have been asked to present the PG corner here at the ISA uh, Kerala State Branch meeting here. That's the online meeting. Uh, from the entire Lissy Hospital Anesthesia team, I would extend a warm regards and thank you for all the uh, support that is being extended. Sorry for the hitch that we had in the earlier bit. Uh, I will ask Dr. Parvati to present the antiplatelet uh, drugs topic first, and then we'll uh, move on to this uh, bronchial blockers by Dr. Indu. Dr. Parvati can start speaking. Yeah, it's a uh, visible uh, Parvati. It's visible. The slides are visible. Hello. I'm actually not able to unmute myself. Uh, telling you are not uh, audible. Uh, if you have opened the other uh, device, please close it. It's an echo. Also. Am I audible, sir? Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, you are audible. Have you opened one more device? No. If you. If it is there, please close it. Huh? Ah, yes, sir. It's closed, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Hospital. I'll be talking about antiplatelet drugs. Uh, so, antiplatelet drugs are a class of drugs which are used, uh, which comes under the antithrombotic drugs which are used to prevent the thrombosis of vessels. The arterial thrombi mainly consists of platelets. So antiplatelet drugs are used to prevent the arterial thrombi and thus uh, helps in reducing the risk of adverse ischemic events. So before talking about the antiplatelet drugs, coming on to the mechanism of thrombogenesis. So usually when the vascular wall is intact, the endothelium secretes certain substances which keeps the platelets in the circulation intact and in inactive state. 
when there is a vessel injury there will be exposure of the underlying subendothelial tissue which will release certain chemical which will release certain chemical substances and there will be an interaction which will lead to thrombogenesis so there is a when there is vascular injury there will be exposure of collagen and non vitamin factors this will help this will lead to the platelet adhering to their surface and these platelets will further get activated and release certain chemical substances and release certain chemical substances which will lead to further platelet recruitment activation of these platelets this will form a platelet aggregate now there is also tissue factor exposure due to the vascular injury and there is inflammation which leads to the activation of coagulase and there will be thrombin generation the thrombin will further uh, help in forming the fibrin from the fibrinogen dr pavadi network issues sir ah uh, yeah okay continue when there is a vessel uh, when there is a vessel wall injury there will be like we said there will be uh, the the, expo- the subendothelial tissues will be exposed and the platelets will come and bind to the subendothelial tish- tissues through the glycoprotein and integrin uh, and the integrins the platelets which are bound to the en- uh, subendothelial tish- tissues now gets activated the platelets all have dense granules in them which have chemical substances inside which will be secreted on the platelet activation now these substances the examples of these substances are thromboxin and adp the thromboxin is synthesized in the dense granules through cox1 pathway so we have a drug called aspirin which will block the cox1 pathway and thus will block the throm- uh, thromboxin a2 synthesis this will prevent platelet aggregation now coming on to adp the adp is another substance which is secreted by the platelet granules these bind to the platelet surface through the p2y12 receptors which are the adp binding receptors there are, there is a class of drug called p2y12 receptor blockers which will block these receptors and thus prevent the binding of adp and platelet aggregation the drugs in this class include ticagrelor cangrelor selatogrel clopidogrel and parasugrel in these the clopidogrel and prasugrel will lead metabolic activation and the others will act directly now uh, also due to this uh, endothelial injury there will be activation of inflammatory pathways and these will stim- trigger the activation of coagulation cascade and thrombin generation these thrombin bind to the platelet surface through protease activated receptor or p par receptors these will then further uh, further the thrombin will activate uh, the fibrinogen fibrinogen into the fibrin and these fibrinogen will help in adhering the platelets together and form a platelet uh, thrombi so there is a drug called vorapaxar or par1 or par4 receptor blockers which will block the attachment of thrombus to the platelet surface also there is a class of drug called glycoprotein 2b 3a inhibitors which will inhibit the attachment of fibrinogen to the platelet surface the drugs in this class include apsiximab eptifibatide and tirofibab now this is a summary of the uh, anti platelet drugs their site of action and mechanism so to summarize there are thromboxin a2 synthesis inhibitor which will act by blocking the cox1 pathway and the drug in this class is aspirin second one is the p2y12 blockers the mechanism is by blocking the adenosine receptors and hence blocks the adp binding the drugs in this class are clopidogrel ticlopidine prasugrel and ticagrelor 
the third one is glycoprotein 2b3a blocker this will inhibit the fibrin formation and attachment to the surface of platelets the drugs are apsiximab eptifibatide and tirofibam the fourth one is thromboxane receptor inhibitor which blocks the thromboxane e2 binding to their receptors the drugs are ifitroban saltroban and daltroban uh, the last one is the par1 blockers which will inhibit the thrombin receptor which will inhibit the thrombin receptors on the platelet surface the drugs are vorapaxar and atopaxar now in detail about each class of drug coming on to aspirin the mechanism of action like we said they inhibit the cox1 and cox2 pathways they prevent the conversion of arachidonic acid to th thromboxin a2 uh, which is the synthesis of the thromboxin which is mediated by cox1 this will decrease the platelet activation the clinical use of these drugs are to prevent mi prophylaxis against clotting in atrial arrhythmias sir the sharing has been disabled so uh, to prevent mi uh, it is used against as a prophylaxis against clotting atrial arrhythmias and stroke it is also used as an analgesic antipyretic and anti inflammatory drug the side effects of aspirin are it causes gi bleed uh, by causing erosive gastritis and peptic ulcers it can also lead to rice syndrome uh, which is encephalopathy and hepatic toxicity it can also lead to renal toxicity also the people who have allergy to aspirin uh, they can have bronchospasm on administration of aspirin now coming on to the second class which is adp receptor antagonist it's also called as thenopyridines or p2 y12 receptor blockers they are further divided into irreversible and reversible blockers the irreversible blockers are ticlopidin clopidogrel and prasugrel and the reversible blockers are ticagrelor and candrelor the mechanism of action includes block the adp mediated platelet aggregation blocks the adp receptors on the platelet surface prevents the expression of glycoprotein 2b 3a by the platelets and inhibits the binding of fibrinogen and clot formation the clinical uses of this drug are it is used to reduce the risk of thrombotic stroke it is used in post stent surgery post mi acute coronary syndrome and unstable angina the side effects of these drugs these class of drugs include bleeding neutropenia thrombotic thrombocytopenic cytopenic purpura which is more common with ticlopidine and thrombocytopenia the third class of drugs are glycoprotein 2b 3a receptor antagonist the drugs are apsiximab eptifibatide and tirofibam the mechanism of action is they are a kind of monoclonal antibody it antagonizes 2b3a glycoprotein receptor on the activated platelets and prevent platelet aggregation it can also be used as anti inflammatory and anti proliferative agent the clinical uses are it is used in patients who have undergone pci or percutaneous coronary intervention or in patients with unstable angina the side effects include bleeding and thrombocytopenia coming on to phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors these include dipyridamol and silostazol the mechanism of action of these drugs are it inhibits the phosphodiesterase inhibitor blocks the breakdown of cyclic amp which will reduce the calcium influx and activation of the platelet it inhibits the platelet activation blocks adenosine uptake by the platelets and it causes vasodilation the clinical uses are to prevent this Uh, prevention of stroke in patients with transient ischemic attacks the side effects include headache facial flushing and hypotension and these side effects are mainly due to the vasodilatory effects of these agents now coming on to some newer antiplatelets these include cancrelor which is a reversible p2 y12 inhibitor the platelet function resumes in 60 minutes after the stopping of drugs it does not require any loading dose 
and thus it can it can be used as a preferred agent of choice the second one is vorapaxar which is a protease activated receptor 1 antagonist antagon uh, it prevents the it uh, antagonizes the thrombin receptors it is effective in mi cardiovascular events and stroke but it has a higher rate of intracranial bleeding now these are the treatment recommendations uh, for the antiplatelet drugs so in clinical practice the most commonly used are aspirin and clopidogrel out uh, the clopidogrel is uh, found to be more effective than aspirin but due to the cost factor we use aspirin uh, aspirin is used more commonly in patients so for primary prevention aspirin can be used for patients with acute coronary syndrome who have undergone pci uh, or uh, any patient with acute coronary syndrome aspirin can be used lifelong along with ticagrelor trazodel or clopidogrel for more than 12 months in a patient with stable angina or former myocardial infarction aspirin is used lifelong along with clopidogrel for a bare met patient with a bare metal stent it is used for more than 1 month and for a patient with drug eluting stent it is used for more than 6 months for a patient with a recent stroke aspirin is used in high risk situation along with clopidogrel for 90 days and for a patient with a past stroke or peripheral vascular disease aspirin or clopidogrel can be used now uh, before uh, we should know uh, uh, the uh, guidelines for the dual antiplatelet therapy in a patient who has under, undergone a percutaneous coronary intervention and this is decided according to the uh, risk of the ischemic event in the uh, assessed in a patient so the patients can have a high bleeding risk and a low ischemic risk in such patients we can uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy must be given for 3 to 6 months for a patient with intermediate ischemic risk it is given for a duration of 1 year and in a patient with high ischemic risk the antiplatelet therapy is given for more than 1 year so when a patient comes to us who has been who has been taking the dual antiplatelet therapy we have to decide when can a surgery be done safely in this patient so there are certain guidelines by the american heart association to uh, about how uh, when can we do an elective non cardiac surgery in a patient who has undergone a recent percutaneous coronary intervention so in a patient with who has had a who is having a bare metal stent and a stable ischemic heart disease and with a low risk a surgery can be scheduled after 6 weeks for a patient who is having a drug eluting stent in situ with a stable ischemic heart disease and a low risk category the surgery can be done after 8 weeks in a patient with bare metal stent or a drug eluting stent who has acute coronary syndrome or a complex percutaneous coronary intervention or a very high thrombotic risk the surgery should be scheduled only after 6 to 12 months and in a patient with a bio reabsorbable stent the surgery is scheduled after 12 months so there are certain uh, uh, peri operative management of a patient with dual antiplatelet therapy so we should uh, we should weigh the thrombotic risk and the bleeding risk in such patients so uh, if the thrombotic risk is very the thrombotic risk in these patients can be high intermediate or low if the thrombotic risk is very high we should decide upon whether we can delay the surgery or not if the surgery is an emergency and cannot be delayed then we should measure the hemorrhagic risk in these patients if the hemorrhagic risk is very high and the thrombotic risk is also high then we have to discontinue dual antiplatelet therapy maintain the patient on aspirin therapy or consider bridge therapy we'll come to the bridge therapy later now if the hemorrhagic risk is intermediate then we can continue the patient on dual antiplatelet therapy or maintain the patient on aspirin or consider bridge therapy if the thrombotic risk is high and the hemorrhagic risk is low then the patient can be continued on the dual antiplatelet therapy 
Now coming on to intermediate thrombotic risk category. In these patients, we should decide whether the surgery is an emergency or not. If the surgery cannot be delayed and if it's emergency, then we have to again weigh the hemorrhagic risk. So in these patients, if the hemorrhagic risk is high, then the patient can be maintained on aspirin. If the hemorrhagic risk is intermediate, then again the patient is maintained on aspirin. If there is low hemorrhagic risk, then we can continue dual antiplatelet therapy. Now coming on to low thrombotic risk. When the patient has a low thrombotic risk and has a uh, high hemorrhagic risk, then we discontinue dual antiplatelet therapy. If the patient has an intermediate hemorrhagic risk, then the patient is maintained on aspirin. And if the hemorrhagic risk is very low, then we can continue the pa patient on dual antiplatelet therapy. Now coming on to bridging therapy. If the play, uh, like we said, when there is a high thrombotic risk and a high bleeding risk where the surgery cannot be delayed, but we have to stop the dual antiplatelet therapy due to the hemorrhagic risk, the bridging therapy comes into picture. The bridging therapy is where uh, the available agents for the bridging therapy are short acting agents of the glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors like eptifibatide and tirofiban and also P2 Y2 L antagonists like cangrelor. These, uh, these are short acting agents and can be used as a bridging therapy. The dual antiplatelet therapy in these patients can be stopped five to seven days before the procedure and the patients are started on these bridging drugs. And uh, this is continued until the patient can be again resumed uh, on the dual antiplatelet therapy after the surgery. This therapy is relatively safer, but the chances of stem thrombosis cannot be avoided. Now, in a patient in whom we have stopped the antiplatelet therapy before the surgery, we should know when to resume the when to again resume it post-operatively. So the aspirin should be stopped seven days before surgery and can be resumed 24 hour post-operatively. The clopidogrel should be stopped five days before the surgery and can be resumed 24 hour post-operatively. The prasugrel is again stopped seven days before the surgery and ticagrelor is stopped three to five days before the surgery. All these drugs can be resumed 24 hour post-operatively. These four are oral agents. Coming on to the intravenous agents, tirofiban is, can be stopped four to eight hours before the surgery and can be resumed four to six hours post-operatively. Eptifibatide four to six hours before the surgery and can be resumed six hours post-operatively. Cangrelor need to be stopped 60 to 90 minutes before the surgery and can be continued four to six hours post-operatively. So these drugs, like we can see, are short acting. And so these are used as a bridge therapy. Now, coming, uh, coming to the summary, uh, over the last few decades, antiplatelets have been used as a mainstay of treatment in patients with coronary artery disease or a stroke. But however, they, are, they come with the risk of bleeding in patients coming for elective surgeries. And if uh, in in these patients, when we stop or withhold the drugs, this can lead, uh, this can have a high risk of thrombosis. So it's important to be familiar with these drugs and outweigh the risk and benefits of their perioperative use. Thank you. Thank you, Parvati, for that extensive presentation on antiplatelet agents. As all anesthetists would agree, uh, antiplatelets are agents are one of the, one group of drugs that are going to be a trouble for the anesthetist throughout. Uh, we still uh, will have problems irrespective of how we use it, how we stop it. Uh, I will open the uh, this thing for uh, questions from the senior faculty. No question, just a comment. It was a very extensive presentation, Parvati. It was done well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijesh. One of the things is uh, I did have my share of uh, issues with one of the um, uh, trauma patients that we did. He was an obese patient and uh, had a fracture, tibia. 
proximal tibia fracture with a tibial plateau. This was at least two or three years back. And uh, we had this patient, uh, we managed it under epidural and uh, combined spinal and epidural technique. Day two, he started developing uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, and mild desaturation. A CTPA done showed a, a PE. Now, that is one of the scenarios where we are stuck. Uh, this is an ASA1 patient, obese, just not started any anticoagulants or anything. That is one of the things that the guidelines don't actually say clearly. If you have an epidural catheter in situ and you want to anticoagulate the patient, how do you manage this patient? Any of the senior colleagues would want to opine on that? Any other risk factors for pulmonary embolism? Did you... No, other than obesity, nothing else. He was just obese. Mm -hmm. I did speak to a couple of uh, senior faculty in Cochin. Uh, they all said, like, give the first shot of anoxaparin, and then after the 12, 12 hours, take out the catheter, and then manage this pain otherwise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because once you, yeah, once you have a diagnosed pulmonary embolism, you have to go on to the uh, therapeutic dose of clexane or the uh, whatever you want to give, the low molecular weight heparin. Once you start giving it therapeutically, it has to be a BD dosage. You cannot actually give it as an OD dosage. Correct. Once you have an OD, a BD dosage of a low molecular weight hints it, uh, going in, it is very difficult to pull out the catheter. Correct. Correct. Because he was obese, I actually gave him 80 milligram shot of subcutaneous uh, clexane one shot and then took out the catheter 24 hours later. And then I start restarted the 40 BD dose, four hours. Luckily, I survived. The patient also survived. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rajiv, there are a few questions in the uh, chat box uh, from the some of the uh, persons attending the first one. I'm not able to see the questions. Just I'll, I'll, uh, There's a comment that aspirin 75 milligram is not a contraindication for uh, subarachnoid block. Yeah, that is true. Aspirin no longer is considered as a contraindication for even subarachnoid block, but aspirin in combination with another agent will become a tricky one. There's another question is, what is the recent uh, ASRA guide, ASRA guidelines for newer antiplatelet drugs? And how I do you detect hemorrhagic risk and thrombotic risk in these patients? I think the latest guidelines already Parvati has mentioned in her talk uh, in detail. Regarding the risk of hemorrhagic and thrombotic risk, I think we will have to go by the uh, side effect and the profiling of how we do with the patients. You will have to take the risk factors into consideration and then see what the extent of surgery is that is going to be done. If you have even the restarting that which Parvati mentioned in her talk, like you can restart four to six hours after the uh, surgery is going to be difficult. You will have to talk to the surgeon, make sure that uh, the surgeon is also happy with the hemostasis that, is, uh, that has been achieved uh, before we actually restart the antiplatelet drugs. Yeah, so it is a risk versus benefit, uh, this thing, and then only we can decide whether the hemorrhagic risk is more or the thrombotic risk is more, and then we'll have to go ahead. Yeah, that is fine. If there are no other questions, shall I ask uh, Dr. Yeah. Indu to make her presentation? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, Indu, you can go ahead with your presentation. Rajesh, shall I ask you one thing? Yeah, go go ahead, Rajesh, madam. Yeah. Are you stopping aspirin for seven days? Still, still. No, on on a regular basis, we are not stopping aspirin regularly. No, if aspirin is only given as a single drug, we are not stopping aspirin. As Parvati has mentioned that, I that's why I asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for space surgeries, it's not sp uh, stop in nowadays, like uh, yes, okay. URP or uh, cataract. It's not stopped. Yeah. It's Especially stop, low molecular stop. weight heparin. And now low molecular yeah. aspirin, sorry. Yeah. Low molecular, okay. But aspirin, yeah. aspirin, aspirin, we are continuing, uh, isn't it? Like a 75 milligram aspirin is not stopped. Ah, uh, yes, like, it's continuing. Continued. Even for closed space, uh, closed space uh, procedures. Aspirin might actually be the only drug that we can give safely in the perioperative period. Yes, okay. Mm. But uh, one, um, uh, 150 milligram, you have to be very careful. Hello. 150 mm. milligram, we have to uh, consider as well as we have to reduce the dose. 
that is in the initial period only we are giving 150 mg after that for maintenance we are giving only 75 mg yeah is true so? madam yeah. yeah yeah it's true madam yeah. okay I think Dr. Indu can start a presentation on bronchial blockers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Go to slide show. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Indu C K from uh, DNB Resident from Lissy Hospital, Arnakulam. I am going to talk about bronchial blockers. Uh, lung suppression techniques are to facilitate surgical exposure and to provide one lung ventilation uh, in patients undergoing thoracic, mediastinal, cardiac, vascular, esophageal, or selective spine surgeries. Uh, the most common indications for lung suppression and one lung ventilation are for providing a still operative field and surgical exposure for uh, lung isolation, for prevention of contamination to the contralateral lung from, uh, from bleeding or pus material during the application of differential lung ventilation, for continuing of the airway gas exchange such as bronchopleural fistula and during lung lavage. Uh, the lung suppression may be of two, uh, by two different techniques, namely W1 endotracheal tubes and endobronchial blockers. The bronchial blockade has been, has been in use since 1930s. It was first used by Archibald in uh, 1935 with an inflatable balloon attached to the end of a rubber catheter to occlude the main bronchus during lobectomy. Uh, Magill improved his uh, Archibald's design in 1936 and in 1938 bronchial tamponage was tried by Kraft Food. And Thompson's bronchial blocker was introduced in 1943 as a, it is now the prototype of all the blockers to follow. It has a stillet and was placed through a rigid bronchoscope and it consisted of two tubes which were fused together. One tube inflated a gauze covered balloon and the other was for applying suction to the bron block bronchus. The uni uh, univent tube is the uh, first modern endotracheal tube with incorporated bronchial blockade. Frogati embolectomy catheters, Swangens catheters, and Foley catheters have all been attempted to be used as bronchial blockers. All the modern balloon tip bronchial blockers used in clinical practice uh, use balloons with low pressure, high volume cuffs to decrease bronchial trauma, and all are intended to be placed in uh, uh, with the guidance by a four millimeter flexible fiber optic bronchoscope. The indications for bronchial blockade are any operations that require surgical exposure through the chest cavity with lung collapse, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, lobectomy and bilobectomy, mediastinal mass resection through the chest, uh, esophageal surgery, uh, spine surgery involving chest, and minimally invasive cardiac surgery. The specific indications for bronchial blockers are uh, difficult airways. Limited mouth opening, nasotracheal intubation, away corotracheal intubation, already intubated patient requiring lung isolation, tracheostomy patient requiring lung isolation, selective lobar blockade, potential for mechanical ventilation in the post-operative period, small adult or pediatric patient, and those who require post who intraoperative lung separation or isolation. The types of endobronchial blockers are single lumen endotracheal tube with an incorporated bronchial blocker, the torque control blocker univent, and independent blocker passed through an in-situ single lumen endotracheal tube and blocker, Cohen tip, deflect, uh, Cohen tip deflecting endobronchial blocker, Fuji uni blocker, EZ blocker. 
these are the tips of the independent blockers will be dealt with in detail later technique of insertion uh, there are two types two techniques of insertion of bronchial blockers namely coaxial placement and paraaxial placement coaxial placement is that a single uh, at first uh, the single human uh, the trachea is intubated with a single human tube uh, endotracheal tube then the endobronchial tube is passed in through the truck uh, to the end through the endo endotracheal uh, single human truck uh, tube and then the uh, fiber optic bronchoscope is passed through the same single human tube uh, and uh, the endobronchial blocker is guided into the uh, targeted bronchus through the, uh, with the help of the fiber optic bronchoscope the paraxial uh, placement is like uh, for, at first the endobronchial uh, blocker is inserted uh, for for almost 26 to 28 cm in case of adults into the trachea and then the single uh, the trachea is intubated with a single human endotracheal tube and then uh, through the endo single human endotracheal tube uh, the fiber optic bronchoscope is passed with the uh, uh, under the uh, guidance of the fiber optic bronchoscope the endobronchial blocker is uh, directed into the targeted bronchus the pediatric size uh, fiber optic bronchoscope is required for coaxial placement uh, so but paraxial positioning of endobronchial blocker can be done using adult fiber optic bronchoscope with outer diameter of even 6 to 6.5 mm in adults coaxial insertion is preferred as the blocker uh, Coaxial insertion is preferred as the blocker remains well anchored through the ET tube, and chances of its free movement in mucosal injuries are less. In small children, small airways uh, because of the small airway size, coaxial placement of a block blocker may not be always possible. So, paraxial placement of endobronchial blocker or Fogarty's catheter is uh, preferred. Uh, then next we go to the types of endobronchial blockers. Uh, first the single human endotracheal uh, tube incorporated with the bronchial blocker that is a torque control blocker univent it is a single human endotracheal tube with an uh, with an enclosed and movable bronchial blocker it has a uh, that uh, single human endotracheal tube is flexible and made of non latex material and the flexible shaft uh, ha having the soft open uh, uh, lumen tip is easier to guide into the bronchus and this is also easy to reposition see it is it is uh, utilized in patients in whom airway is considered difficult for direct laryngoscopy and during unanticipated difficult endotracheal intubation this is a uh, tor uh, this is a tcb univent this is a flexible the, it has a flexible shaft and uh, that will help in the, that will help in high torque control for smooth intubation into the target bronchus and this is the blocker which is also made of which is made of non lactic uh, non lactic and it is soft and it's uh, flexible tip for, it, it's flexible tip helps in placement easy, easily there is a high volume low pressure tracheal cuff which is blue in color which uh, helps in uh, visualizing easily the torque control blocker univent can be used uh, can be left in place if the patient requests post operative ventilatory support the, but the external diameter of the tube is relatively high that is uh, even a 6 mm even an 8 mm tube has an ex external diameter of uh, 13 mm which can be undesirable for an extended ventilation period next is the uh, next we go to the independent blockers uh, namely ant uh, endobronchial blocker it is a snare it is also known as snare guided bronchial blocker it is a wire guided catheter with a loop snare this is a loop snare at the tip of that a fibroscope is passed through the loop of the bronchus uh, through the loop of the blocker and uh, then guided into the desired bronchus and then this is uh, this fibroscope is used to guide into the desired bronchus the blocker is then slid de de distally over the fibroscope and into the selected bronchus the bronchoscopic visualization confirms blocker placement and bronchial occlusion the balloon tipped catheter has a hollow lumen of 1.6 mm which allows suction to facilitate the collapse of the non dependent lung 
the there is a multiport adapter that allows uninterrupted ventilation during positioning of the blocker and the wire may be then removed and have wire one point then the 7.6 mm lumen may be used as a suction port or for oxygen insufflation the outer diameter necessitates a large single lumen tube at least 8 mm to accommodate the bronchial blocker uh it is available in size of 7 french for adults and 5 uh, french for pediatric size uh disadvantages are it is advanced blindly over the fiber optic bronchoscope into the desired main bronchus sometimes the tip of the blocker may get caught at the main carina or at the murphy side of the single lumen tube next is a cohen flexi tip endo bronchial uh, blocker it is designed for uh, use through a single lumen tube with an aid of a small diameter fiber optic bronchoscope uh the it has a rotating wheel that deflects the soft tip by more than 90 degrees and it easily directs into the desired bronchus the bron blocker cuff is a blue high volume low pressure balloon inflated uh which is uh, which is uh, through a the balloon is inflated through a 0.4 mm lumen inside the wall of the blocker the pear shaped blocker cuff has an adequate seal of uh, of the bronchus 6 to 8 ml of air will uh, suffice on the distal shaft above the balloon there is a narrow that uh, when seen in the fiber optic bronchoscope indicates in which direction the tip deflects to position the cohen blocker the arrow is aligned with the bronchus to be intubated and the proximal wheel is turned to deflect the tip towards the desired side and then the blocker is advanced with the fiber optic guidance it is also available in 7 french size and 5 french uh, pediatric size Uh, the cohen flexi tip endo endo bronchial uh, blocker has a soft flexible tip which is uh, being controlled by this rotatory knob and this is uh, the proximal rotatory knob uh, where uh, it is uh, this uh, there is a there will be an arrow mark which will be aligned uh, which has to be aligned according to the uh, target bronchus and then the rotator knob is rotated and the uh, soft flexible tip can be uh, advanced into the the target bronchus uh the in uh, cuff should be inflated under direct fission by the fiber optic endoscope fiber optic bronchoscope which is particularly important during right sided blockage the cuff is inflated near the carina and the nine flange blocker has a central main lumen that uh, that is also 1.6 mm that allows for limited suctioning and uh, oxygen insufflation next is a fuji uni blocker it is all it is a 9 french balloon tipped angle blocker the specialty is that it is an angle blocker with multiple port adapter uh, it is similar to the uni vent uh, the blo tube blocker in the uni vent uh, tube but it can be used as an independent blocker passed by means of a special connector through a standard et tube it is made of silicon material it is fixed it has a fixed distal hockey stick angulation to facilitate insertion into the desired bronchus uh, it has a five french size for pediatric population also this is a fuji uni blocker with an angled uh, the angle tip that is a fixed hockey shaped uh, tip that can uh, that facilitates in advance advancing into the uh, desired bronchus next is the ez blocker it is a recently introduced uh, introduced uh, endobronchial blocker it is a seven, it has a seven french uh, four lumen catheter which has uh, two distal ends each distal end has a balloon that can be guided into the right and left bronchus it has a multipot adapter and it is uh, used through a uh, single lumen tube of si uh, at least size 7.5 mm uh, millimeters internal diameter the end of the y that is the uh, this um, end of the y sits on the carina and each distal end is positioned into the right and left bronchus and the bronchial balloon is inflated in the operative side for lung isolation this is the ez blocker it has uh, two distal ends uh, each of which has a balloon which can be used to block the desired uh, bronchus the y y uh, rests on to the carina the two limbs are also color coded blue and yellow and the appropriate blocker is inflated by a matching color colored pilot balloons these are the characteristic uh, main characteristic features of endobronchial blockers uh, they are uh, the uh, arm blocker is a wire uh, is guided uh, via wire loop to the wire loop that is uh, the snare is uh, 
threaded onto the fiber optic bronchoscope and the guidance feature of cohen blocker is a deflecting deflectable tip with the help of a rotatory knob uni blocker has a prefixed bend and laser blocker has double lumen bifurcated tip <clears throat> the uh, there is uh, the disadvantages include uh, the bronchial blockers cannot be, the blocker cannot be visualized during insertion in case of iron blocker uh, most of these are like that and then the cohen blocker uh, is also is very expensive uni blocker has no steering mechanism though it has a prefix bend it has no steering mechanism to direct it into the uh, desired bron uh, bronchus is a blocker block blocker has a yeah, has uh, two distal uh, lumens but each lumen is small so it is impossible to do suction from the distal aspect the advantages of uh, bronchial blockers are either uh, um, because of the easy recognition of anatomy uh, uh, if the tip of the single tube uh, single tube is above the carina it is easy to recognize the anatomy and uh, likewise the direct uh, it is easy to direct the bronchial blocker and uh, it is best uh, device for patients with difficult airways there are uh, cuff damage during intubation are rare and there is no need to replace a tube if mechanical ventilation is needed the disadvantages include it is it, uh, most of them have small channels for suctioning so suctioning may not be effective conversion from 1 1 to 2 and then 1 to uh, one lung ventilation two lung ventilation and then to one lung ventilation could be more complicated and problematic high may it is a high maintenance device so frequent dislodgement or loss of seal during surgery can occur inflated uh, balloon tipped uh, blockers can dislodge very uh, easily if, uh, while even positioning to lateral position complications related to bronchial blockers include failure to achieve lung separation in case of abnormal anatomy lack of seal within the bronchus and a balloon accidentally uh, getting inflated inside the trachea inclusion of the bronchial blocker or distal wire loop of the arm blocker into the stapling line therefore bronchial block this uh, arm blocker has to be withdrawn a few centimeters before stapling the inflated balloon may move and lodge above the carina uh, next the fogarty endovascular catheter um, uh, is also being used uh, like a bronchial blocker but it has a high pressure low, low volume balloon so it uh, it is not uh, the most suitable one uh, for bronchial blockade as such uh, it does not have a lumen for suction or application of cpap and it is difficult uh, for placing as there is no guiding mechanism uh, uh, but only a stillet is available thank you thank you indu for that excellent exhaustive presentation on bronchial blockers uh, my experience with bronchial pers uh, blockers per se is on the limited side though we do uh, use a lot of dlts for our major lung separation Uh, one of the things that i would want to ask is are bronchial blockers used only in supine position or in lateral position can you use bronchial blockers in prone position or does anyone senior have any comment on that means uh, vijesh would like to add to it maybe uh, dr vijesh has just left because he got okay, okay. called from the hospital okay okay uh, do we use bronchial simply... blockers in uh, prone position i have my doubts yeah, i don't know uh, i use dlt in most yeah. of the times uh, but uh, i think uh, except for esophageal surgeries because my, most of my cases are not lung surgeries it's mainly for esophagus and uh, dr srilada is there srilada yeah the, yeah i think she has used bronchial yes, blockers in prone position onco insertion srilada you can unmute and uh, answer Dr. Sridhar, yeah. uh, yeah. we have a prone position, uh, especially for uh, video assisted in prone position. I'm not saying it's the best thing or it's the correct thing, but when the airway is okay, uh, we have used for esophagectomies in prone oh. position. Okay. Okay. Thank you, madam. Because I have used uh, only DLTs for our uh, thoracoscopic esophagus. Yeah. Because even uh, I'm Rajesh, from... uh, Dr. Suresh here. Oh. we can uh, do a bronchoscopy and check the position uh, suresh sir ah yeah yeah dlt in prone position is 
bronchial block uh, in prone position the problem is it might get dislodged dislodged yeah. mm. and it comes into the trachea there will be massive problem hmm okay so uh, i have not tried uh, bronchial block in prone position so far because we at least Unless use uh, dlt is for prone position yeah dlt for prone DLT position is, is okay it causes yeah. lot of uh, tracheal yeah. trauma it is better mm-hmm. not to use it when you do mm-hmm. want to use between DLT the two, we can use comfortably DLT for a prone versus, position uh, dlt versus bronchial blocker then probably it will safer to use a bronchial blocker if you want to isolate the left lung okay because so. it's the longest uh, uh, the 5 cm length is there so it it might remain there right side definitely not uh, safe to use bronchial blocker okay, in pro- and that to in prone position okay sir okay okay so one of the this thing is the surgeons used to say that when you are using bronchial blockers they get more space working space than dlt for esophageal procedures not for lung yeah that may be true yeah that may be true yeah Anyway, both the students uh, presented well. All the best, uh, best wishes, Par- Dr. Parvati and Dr. Indu. Are you primary students or secondary students? Dr. Rajiv? Dr. Indu is actually a secondary student and Dr. Parvati is actually a primary student. She has just recently joined. Both of them have just joined this year. Okay. Anyway, they have done uh, very well. And uh, all the best for your exams and future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Rajiv, also. Yeah. Okay, okay Randesh, shall we close it? Close yeah, the meeting? Yeah, yes, madam. Okay, first of all, I thank uh, Dr. Rajesh Gaur for the extensive and the excellent talk that he has given on uh, the basics of uh, ongo surgery. And also for uh, the students, Indu as well as Pavadi, they have done it extensively because... Um, we are not familiar with the, uh, even though we are do, uh, hearing as well as we are reading and we are taking the classes on bronchial blockers, we are not at all using uh, because the double lumen tubes are easily, uh, can be used easily. So anyway, they have done it very well and congratulations to both of them. And also thank you very much. And also for thank you, Rajesh, for uh, moderating the session. Thank you all. Thank you, madam. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Good night.